Hello and thank you for joining us for this week's video. We're proud to say we've partnered with MyHeritage for this video. I'm so excited to work with MyHeritage because for years it's been such a useful tool for researching information for this channel. We take pride in getting the accurate details like dates of births and deaths and MyHeritage is the number one family history service. It has an amazing database of over 19 million records that are easy to search. Not only do we use it frequently in our research, but I also use it for my family tree. I thought building a family tree would be difficult, but it's easy on my heritage. One of the coolest features, the Instant Discovery tool, makes filling out your family tree a breeze. Instant Discovery can fill out entire branches of your family tree with just one click. It can also add photos to your family tree. If you have photos you want to add, they have great AI technology that helps repair, enhance, colorize, and even animate pictures. This is a photo of my dad's family. Just look at how easy it is to clean up and add some color. Plus, I found a ton of records on my family. For example, this is my grandfather, who died years before I was born. There are so many details about him that I never knew about, like what church he got married in and when he came to Canada. I even found a record of my great, 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 great grandmother. Something else I thought was really cool was the amount of records they have on my heritage. For example, I found a census record from 1929 when my other grandfather was just a toddler. Why not check out my heritage and build your own family tree? You'll discover your roots and maybe you'll even find some relatives you didn't know about. Right now, my heritage has an amazing deal for our viewers. By clicking on the link or scanning the QR code, you can get a 14 day free trial. So you have nothing to lose, but so much knowledge to gain about yourself and your family. Please check out My Heritage today to learn about your roots. In the process, you'll be supporting Criminally Listed. Number 3. The Richland Serial Killer Richland is a small city in rural South Georgia between Albany and Columbus. In the early 1980s, about 1800 residents called Richland their home. Today, Richland is known for its rum distilleries that make rum using locally grown sugar cane. A series of unsolved murders from the early 1980s still haunts the small city. On June 28, 1981, 14 year old Tanya Nix rode her brother's moped to a local playground. She never returned home from that ride. The moped and helmet were found about a mile from her house. People searched for months, but they found no other traces of the 14 year old girl. On October 24, 1981, the body of a young woman was found in the charred ruins of a vacant house three miles south of Richland. But it was not Tanya Nix's body. Instead, it was the body of 17-year-old Valerie Marie Sellers. The killer tied her hands with coat hangers and strangled her. Valerie, who lived in Blakely, Georgia, came 55 miles north to Richland to visit her boyfriend. She was last seen walking in the town center two days earlier. A few months later, on the day after Christmas 1981, in a wooded area about three miles north of Richland, deer hunters found the skeletal remains of the first missing girl, 14-year-old Tanya Nix. She had been tied to a tree. She had been strangled to death with a wire. Three months went by. On March 28, 1982, 16-year-old Juana Faye Reddick and her 7-year-old sister, Leticia Reddick, were sleeping in the same bed in their home in Richland. Around 3.20 a.m., their mother was awoken by Leticia screaming. She went to the bedroom and tried to turn on the light, but it didn't work. Nevertheless, she discovered that Wanda was gone. Leticia said that a large man with an afro climbed over her and grabbed her sister by the throat. He then carried Wanda out of the house through the front door. The girl's mother tried to turn on other lights, but it turned out that the kidnapper had removed all the light bulbs. The police and the public searched for the girl, but they did not locate her. Six days after the kidnapping, a postal worker discovered the body face down in a pond spillway about two miles east of Richland. Wanda's body was visible from the road. The police thought that this was incredibly odd because they had previously searched the area. Her body was only clad in a t-shirt. The killer tied her hands behind her back with her clothes and beat her. The funeral director said she was hit in the head with a sharp object such as an axe or a hammer. 
The medical examiner said that all three girls had been strangled to death. The police said that the girls had not been sexually assaulted. While they noted similarities between the murders, the police also said there were major differences in the cases. For example, Wanda's case, she was abducted from her home while the other girls went missing from public areas. Tanya and Valerie were strangled and Wanda was beaten and strangled. Tanya and Valerie were white and Wanda was black. However, the police didn't rule out the possibility the one man murdered all three teenage girls. Sadly, these were not the only murders in the area at the time. In April 1982, Renee Blackmore, a 20-year-old U.S. Army private, was stationed at Fort Benning in Columbus, Georgia. Fort Benning, now called Fort Moore, is about 35 miles north of Richland. Blackmore was from Arizona, and she was a medic with the 197th Infantry Brigade. On the night of April 29th, Renee Blackmore left on a borrowed motorcycle from her barracks. She never returned to the base. Military police assumed she had taken off and listed her as a deserter. A month later, Blackmore's wallet and sweater were found on the side of the road near Casita, Georgia. Two months later, on June 28, 1982, the body of 20-year-old Renee Blackmore was found on a logging road not far from where wallet and sweater were found. She had been shot to death with a shotgun. Many people thought that one person killed all four women. By June 1982, the police had questioned over 1,700 people and performed polygraph tests on 100. They had three dedicated officers working full-time on the cases. The Richland residents were scared and frustrated with the lack of progress of the case. However, the police did develop a suspect. He was 24-year-old unemployed pulp worker Marcellus McCluster. He became a suspect because of a similar murder he committed on January 4, 1983. 58-year-old Major White was a man with disabilities who lived in the small town of Lumpkin, Georgia. Lumpkin is just over 8 miles west of Richland. White received Social Security and did odd jobs to supplement his income. On January 5, 1983, his burnt remains were found tied to a tree two and a half miles outside of Lumpkin. The medical examiner determined that he had been beaten in the head and shot three times in the back with a 30-30 rifle. There was a fist-sized piece of flesh missing from his face. After he was beaten and shot, he was tied to the tree and set ablaze. The cluster became a suspect because he lived in Lumpkin, which had a population of just over 1,300. The police knew he had a 30-30 rifle and he had recently purchased ammunition for it in Lumpkin. The police got the gun and it was tested for ballistics. It was determined to be the gun that was used to kill White. On January 19, 1983, two weeks after the body was found, a cluster was arrested. The next day, he confessed to the murder. He said the chunk of flesh that was missing from White's face was because he had shot him in the face. The police immediately saw connections between White's murder and the murders of the four young women. White and the four women had all been bound. There were the most similarities between the murder of White and Renee Blackmore. Both had been shot and tied to a tree. The first victim, Tanya Nix, had also been tied to a tree, but she was strangled and not shot. The police tried to connect McCluster to the murders of the four young women. In McCluster's car, they found some wire that looked like the wire used to bind Tanya Nix. But they could not find any stronger evidence, so he was not charged with their murders. McCluster agreed to a plea deal in Major White's murder. In exchange for pleading guilty, he would not be sentenced to death. In September 1983, he was sentenced to life in prison. What is notable about Ben McCluster is that after he was arrested in January 1983, the murders in the Richland area came to an end. Nevertheless, the murders of Tanya Nix, Valerie Sellers, Wanda Reddick, and Renee Blackmore all went cold. 37 years passed, then in 2020, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation started a cold case unit made up of retired investigators. 
In 2022, the police were able to tie McCluster toward a Blackmore's murder. In April 2022, 64-year-old McCluster, who had been in prison since 1983, was indicted for malice murder and felony murder. The authorities did not detail what evidence connected McCluster to Blackmore's murder after 40 years. At the time of this recording, he has not been charged with the murders of the other three young women, nor did the authorities say that he was a person of interest. As of May 2024, the murders of Tanya Nix, Valerie Sellers, and Warner Reddick remain unsolved. No trial date has been set for Marcellus McCluster. Currently, the 66-year-old is incarcerated at the Augusta State Medical Prison in Augusta, Georgia. Number 2. The Washington Strangler In November 1976, 30-year-old Barbara Jean Lewis lived in Penn Hills Township, Pennsylvania. Penn Hills is in Allegheny County. Lewis worked as a secretary in an office in downtown Pittsburgh. Every day, she walked five minutes from her home to a bus stop. As usual, on the morning of November 17, 1976, she left at 6.15 a.m. Less than three hours later, her dead body was found in a commercial-grade trash can behind a business a few miles from her home. Her wrists had been bound behind her back with her nylon stockings and belt. She was partially dressed, and the clothing she was wearing was hastily put on, possibly by her killer. Her bra was torn and not on her body properly, and her underwear was inside out. However, the police said she had not been sexually assaulted. The killer strangled her to death with his hands. After she was dead, paper gauze was stuffed into her mouth and nostrils. The police had several suspects, but never made any arrests. Just a week later, on November 24, 1976, at approximately 6.10 p.m., 21-year-old Susan Rush left her job at the Washington Mall in South Strayband, Pennsylvania. South Strayband is a township in Washington County, which is about 45 miles south of Penn Hills. Rush never made it home. The next morning, her brother was driving, and he noticed her car parked on a road near the mall. In the trunk, he found the dead body of his 21-year-old sister. Rush was wearing pants and a turtleneck that was inside out. The medical examiner believed Rush died around midnight. She had been strangled to death with a string or a piece of leather. Shortly before she died, she had sex. Rush's family said that she was very religious and to their knowledge had never been on a date. So she did have sex, she only agreed to it because she thought it might have saved her life. 16-year-old Mary Irene Jensi lived in North Charleroi, a borough in Washington County. It is about 22 miles east of South Strayban. On February 13, 1977, nearly three months after Susan Rush was killed, Mary left her family's home to meet some friends for dinner. Sadly, she never returned home. Six days later, her body was found in a wooded area in the neighboring township. The medical examiner thought she might have been raped, but could not say that for certain. What was clear is that she had been beaten to death with a heavy object, like a tire iron. She had been struck over a hundred times. Finley is a township in Allegheny County. It was home to 17-year-old Deborah Jeanette Capioli. On the morning of March 17, 1977, Deborah left her home at 7.45 to catch her school bus. Her brother walked with her most mornings, but that day he was not attending school. When the bus arrived about eight minutes later, Deborah was not there. Her dead body was found ten days later near an abandoned strip mine that was three miles from her home. She had been raped and strangled to death with her blue jeans. On the night of May 18, 1977, 18-year-old Brenda Lee Ritter spent the evening with her boyfriend. Around 10 p.m., she dropped her boyfriend off at his home in Houston, Pennsylvania. At the time, the people in Allegheny and Washington counties were in a panic about the rash of murders. Young women were urged to be careful, and if possible, not to go out in public alone. Ritter's boyfriend and his mother ensured her car doors were locked when she left and told her to head straight home. 
Tragically, she never made it home. Initially, her family was not concerned when she didn't return home because there were intense thunderstorms in the area that night. They assumed she had stayed over at her boyfriend's home. The next morning, they realized she was missing. Later that day, Brenda Ritter's car was found abandoned in the South Strayband Township. The police started to organize a search party. But then, officers in a state police helicopter found her body three quarters of a mile from her car. Ritter had been raped and then strangled to death. The killer had used her underwear to strangle her. He had created a grot with them using a stick. After the murder of Brenda Ritter, the police developed a theory about the killer. Ritter knew that there was a good possibility that a dangerous man was preying on women. So it's doubtful she would have picked up anyone while driving. The police thought that the killer may have been someone in law enforcement or posing as law enforcement and he got her to stop. However, this line of investigation did not lead to an arrest. In June 1977, 26-year-old Roberta Elam, who went by Robin, was in the process of becoming a Catholic nun. She lived at Mount St. Joseph Mother House in Wheeling, West Virginia. Wheeling is about 30 miles west of Washington County. On June 13, 1977, it is believed that Elam went to a field near the Mother House to pray. Her dead body was found a short time later in the field. She had been raped and strangled to death. The killer used his hands to strangle her. After the murder of Robin Elam, the murder stopped. Between November 1976 and June 1977, six women between the ages of 17 and 30 were murdered in a 50 mile radius. Five of the six were strangled to death. The only one who wasn't strangled was Mary Jensi, who was beaten to death. In the media, the killer was dubbed the Washington Strangler, even though only half the murders happened in Washington County. The police did not think that the killer would stop on his own. Instead, they think he most likely moved to another area and continued to murder women. However, they knew it was possible that he had been arrested for another unrelated crime and imprisoned, or he died. Also, not everyone was convinced that one person committed all six murders. They turned out to be right because progress was made in some of the cases over the decades. In July 1977, 9 year old David Diwali was arrested for the February 1977 murder of 16-year-old Mary Jensi. Two brothers, who were classmates of Mary, saw Mary in Diwali's car 90 minutes before she was killed. However, the charges were later dropped due to a lack of evidence. Then, in May 2010, 33 years after the murder, the police announced that they had made two arrests in the case. David Diwali was arrested again, along with another man named Robert Irwin. Irwin had dated Mary for about two years. Both Irwin and Diwali were interviewed in 1977 at the time of the murder and again in 2009. Irwin and Diwali both denied seeing Mary on the night she was killed. Diwali also denied having any sexual relations with Mary. Irwin, her ex-boyfriend, said they did not have sex within a month of her murder. It turned out that when Mary died, she was six months pregnant. Testing revealed it was Irwin's baby. Irwin claimed he did not find out about the pregnancy until after she was dead. In 2010, Mary's clothing was sent for DNA testing. In her underwear, the DNA of several people was found. Two sets of DNA were from Diwali and Irwin. Irwin's semen was also found on her blue jeans. In May 2010, Diwali and Irwin, who were both 53, were arrested. After they were charged, Diwali changed his story and said he had picked up Mary that night. They parked close to the scene where she was murdered. She performed oral sex on him in his vehicle. Then she said she had to urinate and left his vehicle, but never returned. In the lead up to their trials, David Diwali changed his story for a third time. He agreed to testify against Irwin in exchange for a plea deal. 
the murder charges were dropped and he pleaded guilty to hindering apprehension and tampering with physical evidence and he was sentenced to two to four years of prison. Robert Irwin went to trial in October 2011. Devoy testified that he, Irwin, and Mary were smoking weed that night in his vehicle. They both had sex with her. Then Irwin took a tool out of the back of his vehicle and started striking Mary. She ran and Irwin chased her and finished beating her to death. There were several problems with the case. Notably, the star witness, David Diwali, had changed his story three times. The third time he changed his story, it greatly benefited him because he got a plea deal. Irwin's DNA was found on Mary's underwear and jeans. However, the DNA expert testified that the DNA could have got on there earlier and remained on the clothes even if they had been washed several times. Also, the DNA showed that he had sexual relations with Mary, not that he killed her. Finally, Devoli was seen with Mary that night, but Irwin was not. Irwin chose to be tried by a judge and not jury. The judge was Paul Pozonski. The trial lasted four days. Robert Irwin was found guilty of third-degree murder. Judge Pozonski sentenced Irwin to 10 to 20 years of prison. Then a year and a half later, the case had an unusual twist. In May 2013, the judge on the case, Paul Bozonski, was charged with stealing cocaine from evidence in drug cases. In March 2015, he pleaded guilty to theft by unlawful taking, obstructing administration of law, and misapplication of entrusted property. He was sentenced to 30 days to 23 and a half months in jail. After the judge pled guilty, Robert Irwin's lawyer filed an appeal arguing that the judge was under the influence during the trial. One person who thought that Irwin should be released was Mary Jensie's brother, Stephen. He did not think there was enough evidence to convict Irwin. He also believed that David Devoli had a lot more to do with the murder. But Irwin's appeal was denied. Robert Irwin is not listed as being incarcerated on the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections website. It's unclear when he was released from prison. The police also developed a suspect in the murder of 17-year-old Deborah Capiola. On the morning Deborah was kidnapped, 22-year-old David Kennedy's car was spotted in her neighborhood. He drove a distinctive maroon Oldsmobile Cutlass with a vinyl top. The police talked to Kennedy's employers and he was late for work on the morning of the kidnapping. He told his co-workers they had a flat tire. When the police questioned him, he said he was late because he had gone to a car dealership. Two days before the body was found, some kids found Kennedy's belongings in the area where the body would eventually be found. The police talked to state game wardens and they recalled seeing his car twice in the area where the body was found on the day of the murder. Then, several days after the body was found, Kennedy removed the vinyl top of his car. While the police were highly suspicious of David Kennedy, they did not find any physical evidence that tied him to the murder. So Deborah Capiola's murder went cold. In September 2000, over 22 years after the murders, the cases were reopened. One of the first murders they looked at was Deborah Capiola's murder because they had a suspect in that case, David Kennedy. The police believed that Kennedy had been stalking Deborah because Kennedy had been seen driving around her neighborhood. Also, she was kidnapped on the morning when her brother wasn't walking with her. The evidence from Deborah's case was sent for DNA testing. The investigators got a blood sample from Kennedy. He then started stalking the lead investigator on the case, Rebecca Loving. Forensic experts were able to get a DNA sample from Deborah's genes. It was compared to Kennedy's DNA. It was a match. The evidence from the four other cases were sent for DNA testing and they got several surprises. Male DNA was found on the evidence from two of the murders, Susan Rush's and Robin Elam's. They were not a match to Kennedy's DNA. However, they were a match to each other, meaning one person killed them. But no match to that DNA has been found. It's unclear if there is any DNA evidence from Barbara Lewis's murder. DNA was found on the evidence from Brenda Ritter's murder, 
but it wasn't enough for testing at the time. So with one case solved, in December 2001, David Kennedy was arrested for the murder of Deborah Capiola. He went to trial in November 2001 and he was found guilty of murder. He was sentenced to life without parole. The police have not given any updates on the other four unsolved murders, Barbara Lewis, Susan Rush, Brenda Ritter, and Robin Elam. Since the DNA testing in 2000, DNA technology has improved greatly, so experts may now be able to generate a DNA profile from the evidence in the murder of Brenda Ritter. Also, the police have the killer's DNA profile from the murders of Susan Rush and Robin Elam, so genetic genealogy could be done to find their killer and possibly the killer of Barbara Lewis and Brenda Ritter if the same person killed them. Hopefully, we'll have an update on these cases in the near future. Number 1. The Calgary Sex Worker Killer Calgary, Alberta is Canada's fourth biggest city. It is home to a series of unsolved murders of sex workers that are believed to have been committed by one person. On July 19, 1986, the dead body of 26-year-old Elaine Krauschner was found in a ditch close to Little Jumping Pound Creek Bridge outside of Cochrane, Alberta. She had been strangled to death. She was last seen about 12 hours earlier working in the streets in a popular area for sex workers called Hooker Stroll in downtown Calgary. She was last seen getting into a brown Chevrolet or Pontiac. She told a fellow sex worker that he was a regular client. He was described as a white man between 30 and 40 with a collar length, dark hair and a beard. He had a pockmarked face and wore glasses. The witness said he was dirty looking and overweight. The police said it was possible that this man wasn't the killer. The killer may have picked up Krausner after she was done with the regular customer. It was six months later, on New Year's Day 1987, 21-year-old Annette Legier went missing. Her body was found six months later near Drumheller, Alberta. Drumheller is about 85 miles northeast of Calgary. Since her body was so badly decomposed, the medical examiner could not determine the cause of death. But the police believe she was murdered. In the spring of 1988, 20-year-old Sheila Ritchie was living on the streets of Calgary. On April 18, 1988, she went missing. She was found in a field southeast of Calgary a month later, on May 17th. She had been shot to death. Joanne Shaver was born in October 1972. When she was 12, she ran away from home and got into the sex trade. In early 1990, Joanne was 17. She was a ward of the province and lived in a group home. She was still doing sex work, but wanted to get away from that life. On January 8, 1990, she was seen working the streets of Calgary. The next day, her partially clad body was found on the side of a country road southwest of Calgary. She had been sexually assaulted and then strangled from behind. 20-year-old Shauna Vanderbash, who had recently moved to Calgary, worked as a hairdresser and as an escort. A year and a half after the last murder, on the night of June 19, 1991, Vanderbash socialized with co-workers at a Calgary restaurant. The group went to a fashion show around 9.30. An acquaintance was the last to see Vanderbash alive when she dropped her off around 3.30 a.m. Her new dead body was discovered five hours later beside a country road southwest of Calgary. She had been strangled to death. 16-year-old Jennifer Jans grew up in Calgary. As a child, she excelled in school and was active in ballet, gymnastics, and track and field. But Jans started acting out in her preteens. She failed the seventh grade and dropped out after the ninth grade. After dropping out of school, Jans moved in with some friends and spent most of her time on the streets. Every so often, she went back to live with her parents. Hoping to help their daughter, when she was 15, her parents sent her to a Bible camp in Texas for two months. The camp seemed to have worked because when she returned, she got a job and was active in youth groups. 
In February 1991, she re-enrolled in school, but she only lasted six weeks. In July 1991, shortly after her 16th birthday, her kidneys became infected and she had to be hospitalized. Her family visited her daily. On July 12, 1991, Janice called her mother to tell her she was leaving the hospital and she'd be joining the family for dinner. Janice was last seen leaving the emergency room. A month later, on August 16th, the body of 16-year-old Jennifer Janice was discovered in a shallow grave at a construction site in northwest Calgary. The killer had beat her to death. The medical examiner determined she died from a heavy blow to the chest. It was around this time that a theory about a serial killer emerged. Within five years, six women between the ages of 16 and 26 had been killed and their bodies dumped in remote areas. Many have been sex workers or lived on the streets at some point. Unfortunately, the killings continued. In 1986, 12-year-old Jennifer Joy's mother died in a car accident. After that, she became a ward of the province. She was well liked at school and at least one of her teachers thought she had tremendous potential. However, Joyce was drawn to living on the streets and did sex work to make money. But in August 1991, the 17-year-old was trying to leave that life behind and was living in an independent living facility. On August 30th, 1991, she was reported missing from the facility. Just over a month later, on October 6, 1991, her body was found in a shallow grave about one and a quarter miles south of where Jennifer Jans' body was found two months earlier. The police never revealed the cause of death. 29-year-old Keely Pincott was a mother who worked as a cocktail waitress, but she dreamed of more in life. She wanted to get into makeup and modeling. On November 7, 1991, her mother reported her missing. Keeley's mother had not talked to her since May 1991. On March 10, 1992, Pincott's skeletal remains were found northeast of Cochrane. Cochrane is about 20 miles northwest of Calgary. The medical examiner identified her by x-rays and dental records. If a cause of death was determined, it was never made public. According to the family of 38-year-old Anita Evans, who was also known as Anita Gilovich, was involved with drugs and a rougher crowd. On January 18, 1992, Evans was found murdered in a beaver pond in the Inglewood Bird Sanctuary, a park in central Calgary. Because of her lifestyle, it's unknown when Evans went missing. The cause of death is also unknown. In the autumn of 1992, 26-year-old Tracy Maunders was dying of cancer. Maunders had an 11-year-old son. She was doing sex work to pay for airfare so her son could visit his grandparents while she got treatment. On October 28, 1992, she was reported missing. Three days later, she was found in a field east of Calgary. She had been stabbed to death. Rebecca Boutlier was born in Cape Breton, Nova Scotia. Her mother moved the family to Calgary after her husband died in a car accident when Boutlier was 18 months old. While her mother said that her daughter's life was rocky, she claimed that they were close. As a teenager, unbeknownst to her mother, Boutlier got into drugs and sex work. In December 1991, Boutlier gave birth to a son. Fifteen months later, on February 12, 1993, 20-year-old Boutlier was seen walking on the stroll in downtown Calgary. Another worker thought she saw her getting into a blue car. Rebecca Boutier's body was found a month later, on March 11th, buried under a pile of roof shingles in the northeast part of the city. The killer had stabbed her to death. Her boots, purse, and belt were not with her. The police suspected that the killer kept them. Near her body was a pile of women's clothing that did not belong to her. The police traced the clothing to another woman who lived in a nearby motel. The woman told the police about an incident she called a bad date. She said that a man attacked her in his vehicle but didn't go into any further details and she did not want to press charges. 
After that, the murder seemingly came to an end. Between July 1986 and February 1993, 11 women were murdered in Calgary. They ranged in age from 16 to 38. All their bodies were dumped in remote areas, mostly in western Calgary and west of the city. Some believe that one person killed all the women, while others think that there are major differences in the cases that suggest that more than one killer was at work. Many of the victims were involved in sex work and at times lived on the street, but not all of them. They also died in different ways. Most were strangled, some were beaten to death, one was shot to death, and the last two were stabbed. Also, in some cases, the cause of death, if they were determined, were not made public. If any forensic evidence connects all or even some of the cases, the police have not made that information public. Since many of the victims worked in the sex trade, the police talked to sex workers in the city about clients they call bad dates. They also checked out recent parolees and sexual offenders. In 1993, the Calgary Police and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police assembled a task force to investigate the murders in the Calgary area. They went to Edmonton to meet with top FBI profilers. They examined the links between 15 murders, but they did not say which 15 murders they were investigating. Also, the information from those meetings were never made public. Since some of the victims' bodies were discovered outside the city limits, the Calgary Homicide Unit worked with the RCMP Major Crimes Unit. The Joint Task Force interviewed many prison inmates, hoping to find information. Investigators even polygraph tested inmates. They thought it was quite possible that the killer was serving a long sentence in prison. Over the years, a few suspects emerged and have even been arrested. In 1989, David Ulett was charged with the shooting death of Sheila Ritchie. Several people said he confessed to the shooting. He went to trial in October 1989. Two people said that he confessed to the murder in March 1988, but a social worker said she saw Richie a month later in April. He was acquitted of the charges in October 1989. In 1990, James Arthur Link was accused of killing 17-year-old Joanne Shaver. Link had previously served four years in prison for sexual assault. He matched a general description of the last person seen with Shaver. His vehicle was searched and three hairs and a fiber were found. An expert believed the hairs were shavers and the fiber came from her sweater. Also, a strand of hair was found on Shaver's sweater. The expert thought it belonged to Link. Link went to trial in November 1990 and the judge acquitted him. In 1991, the police arrested 42-year-old Isdoro Hernandez for Shonda Vanderbash's murder. Like Vanderbash, Hernandez was a hairdresser, and the two were familiar with each other. However, DNA proved that he wasn't the killer, and he was cleared of all charges. Another suspect was Barry Thomas Niedermeyer. He was convicted of sex trafficking a 14-year-old Calgary girl throughout British Columbia in the early 1980s. However, the police could not connect Niedermeyer to the murders in Calgary. In 2000, he was charged with 14 offenses against Vancouver sex workers. In 1996, the police investigated 36-year-old Dr. Ernest Stefan Schmitz, a German dermatologist who had lived in Edmonton from 1990 to 1993. Edmonton is about 185 miles north of Calgary. After leaving Edmonton, he went back to Berlin. In March 1996, Schmitz was arrested for one murder and three attempted murders of sex workers in Berlin. He was also the suspect in the murder of two other sex workers and the disappearance of another one. The police thought he might have been responsible for five of the 11 murders we covered in this video. They are the murders of Shana Vanderbass, Jennifer Gans, Jennifer Joyce, Tracy Maunder, and Rebecca Boutier. In November 1997, Schmitz went to trial in Berlin for one count of murder and three counts of attempted murder. He was found guilty and he was sentenced to life. The police have never ruled him out as a suspect in the Calgary murders.
In 2003, 10 years after the last murder, the RCMP developed Project Hare, a task force to investigate the murders and disappearances of many vulnerable people in the Calgary and Edmonton areas. A 2011 report, The Tragedy of Missing and Murdered Aboriginal Women, found that sex workers were 60 to 100 times more likely to be murdered. Authorities investigating these crimes have never officially claimed this was the work of a serial killer. But to assume that multiple men committed all these murders that abruptly stopped in 1993 suggests this is more than a coincidence. At the time of this recording, the 11 murders remain unsolved. Thank you so much for watching this video. We just want to thank My Heritage again for sponsoring this video. You should check them out and start building your own family tree. If you click on the link in the description box or scan the QR code on the screen now, you'll get a 14-day free trial and you'll be supporting this channel. Thanks again for watching.